Who the heck are you? The silhouette demanded. The voice sounded like it belonged to a young woman, one who was itching for a fight. When it, I failed to answer, a stocky female avatar stepped outside of the shadows into the dark, into the chamber's flickering torchlight. She had raven hair styled Joan of Arc style, short, and appeared to be in her late teens, early 20s. As she got closer, I realized that I knew her. Well, I, we'd never actually met, but I recognized her face from the dozens of screenshots I, she posted on her blog over the years. It was Artemis. She wore a suit called the gunmetal blue armor that looked more sci-fi than fantasy. Twin blaster pistols were still low on her hips and in quick draw holsters. And there was a long curved elvish sword and a scabbard across her back. She wore fingerless road warrior style racing gloves and a pair of classic Ray-Ban shades. Overall, she seemed to be going for a sort of mid eighties post-apocalyptic cyberpunk girl next door look. And it was working for me in a big way. In a word, as she walked towards me, the heels of her studded combat boots clicked on the stone floor. She halted just out of my sword's reach, but did not draw her own blade. Instead, she slid her shades up under her avatar's forehead, a blatant of action. Since the sunglasses didn't actually affect the player's vision, it looked, it looked me up and down, making a show of sizing me. For a moment, I was too starstruck to speak, to break my paralysis. I reminded myself that the person operating the avatar in front of me might not be a woman at all. And this girl who might have been cyber crushing on for the past three years might very well be an obese, hairy knuckled guy named Chuck. Once I conjured up that sobering image, I was able to fo focus my situation uh, at the question at hand. What was she doing here? After five years of searching, I thought it was highly improbable that we'd both discovered the Copper Key's hiding place on the same night. Too big of a coincidence. I got your tongue, she asked. I said, who the heck are you? Like her, I had my avatar's name tag switched off. Clearly, I wanted to remain anonymous, especially under the circumstances. Couldn't she take a hint? Greetings, I said, bowing slightly. I'm Juan Sanchez, Villa Lobez Ramirez. She smirked. Chief Metallurgist of King Charles V of Spain. At your service, I replied, grinning. She'd caught my obscure Highlander quote and thrown another right back at me. It was Artemis, all right. Cute. She glanced over my shoulder at the empty dais and back at me. So, spill it. How'd you do it? How'd you do? Uh, do what? Uh, jousting against Akarak, she said, if it, as, as if it were obvious. Suddenly I understood. This wasn't the first time she'd been here. I wasn't the first gunter to decipher the limerick and find the Tomb of Horrors. Artemis had beaten me to it. And since she knew about the joust game, she'd obviously already faced the Lich herself. But if she had already had the copper key, there wouldn't be any reason for her to come back here. So she clearly didn't have the key yet. She'd faced the lich at joust, and he'd beaten her. So she'd come back to try again. For all I knew, this could be her eighth or ninth attempt. And she obviously assumed that the lich had beaten me too. Hello, she said, tapping her right foot impatiently. I'm waiting. I considered making a break for it, just running right past her back out through the labyrinth and up to the surface. But if I ran, she might suspect that I had the key and decide to kill me to get it. The surface of Ludus was clearly marked as a safe zone on the Oasis map. So, no player versus player combat was allowed, but I had no way of knowing if the same was true of this tomb, because it was underground. It didn't appear on the planet map. Artemis looked at f like a formidable opponent, body armor, blaster pistols, and that elvish sword she was carrying might be horrible. If even half of the exploits she'd mentioned in her block were true, her avatar was probably at least 15th level or higher. If a V3 compound was permitted down here, she'd kick my 10th level butt. So I had to play this cool. I decided to lie. Got creams. Jeff's isn't really my game. She relaxed her posture slightly. That seemed to be the answer she wanted. Yeah, same here, she said in a commiserating tone. Halliday programmed old King Akarak with some pretty wicked AI, didn't he? He's insanely hard to beat. She glanced down at my sword, which was still brandishing defensively. You can put that away. I'm not going to fight you. I kept my sword raised. Is the tomb in a PvP zone? Don't know. You're the first avatar I've ever run into down here. She tilted her head slightly and smiled. I suppose there's only one way to find out. She drew her sword, lightning fast, and turned into a clockwise spin. 
bringing its glowing blade around and down at me in a single blur of motion. At the last second, I managed to tilt my own blade upward and awkwardly parry the attack, but both of our swords halted in midair, inches apart, as if held back by some invisible force. A message flashed on my display. Player versus player combat not permitted here. I breathed a sigh of relief. I wouldn't learn until later that the keys were non-transferable and you couldn't drop one of them or give them to another avatar and if you were killed while holding one, it vanished right along with your body. Well, there you have it, she said grinning. There's a no PvP zone after all. She whipped her sword around in a figure eight pattern and then smoothly replaced the scabbard on her back. Very slick. I sheathed my own sword too, but without any fancy moves. Halliday must not have wanted anybody to duel for the right to joust the king, I said. Yeah, she said, lucky for you. Lucky for me, I replied, folding my arms. How do you figure? She mentioned, motioned the empty dais behind me. You must be really hurting for points right now if you're fighting Akarak. So if Akarak beat you at Joust and then you had to fight him, good thing I won, I thought. Also, I'd probably be creating a new avatar right now. I've got hit points galore, I fibbed. That lich was a total wuss. Oh, really? She said suspiciously, I'm 52nd level and he's nearly killed me every time I come down here. And she eyed me a moment and said, I also recognize your sword and the armor you're wearing. You got both of them right here in this dungeon, which means they're better than whatever your avatar had before. You look like a low level wimpazoid to me, Juan Ramirez. And I think you're hiding something. Now that I knew she couldn't attack me, I considered telling her the truth. Why not just whip the copper key and show her? But I thought better of it. The smart move now was to split and head straight for Middletown while I still had a head start. She still didn't have the key and might not get it for several more days. If I hadn't already had so many hours to joust practice under my belt, God knows how many attempts it would have taken me to beat the Akra. Think what you want, Shira, I said, moving past her. Maybe I'll run into you off world sometimes. We can duke it out then. <clears throat> I gave her a small wave. See you around. <coughs> Where do you think you're going? She said, following me. Home, I said, still walking. Where about the lich and the copper key? She went to the empty dais. He'll respawn in a few minutes when the Oasis server clock hits midnight and the whole tomb resets. If you were right here, you'd get another shot at beating him without having to make your way all the way through those traps again first. That's why I've been coming here just before midnight every other day, so I can get in two attempts in a row back to back. Clever. If I hadn't succeeded on my first try, I wonder how it would take me to figure that out. I thought we could take turns playing against him, I said. I just played him, so it'd be your turn at midnight, okay? Then I'll come back after midnight tomorrow and we can alternate days until one of us beats him, sound fair? I suppose, she said, studying me, but you should stick around anyway. Something different might happen if there were two avatars here at midnight. Anorak probably prepared for that contingency. Maybe two instances of the Lich will appear, one for each of us to play, or maybe, I prefer to play in private, I said. Let's just take turns, okay? I was almost at the exit when she stepped in front of me, blocking my path. Come on, hold up a second. Her voice said softening. Please. I could have kept walking right through her avatar, but I didn't. I was desperate to get to Middletown to locate the first gate, but I was also standing in front of the famous Artemis, someone I'd fantasized about meeting for years. She was even cooler in person than I'd imagined. I was dying to spend more time with her. I wanted, as the 80s poet Howard Jones would say, to get to know her well. If I left now, I might never run into her again. Listen, she said, glancing at her boots. I apologize for coming, calling you a low-level wimpazoid. That was not cool. I insulted you. It's okay. You're right, actually. I'm only level, I'm only 10th level. Regardless, you're a fellow gunter and a clever one too, or you wouldn't be standing here. So you want to know that I respect you and I acknowledge your skills and I apologize for the trash talk. Apology accepted. No worries. Cool. She looked relieved. Her avatar's facial expressions were extremely realistic, which usually meant they were synced to those of her operator instead of controlled by the software. She must be using an expensive rig. I was just a little freaked to find you here, she said. I mean, I knew someone else would find this place eventually, just not so quickly. I've had this tomb all to myself for a while now. How long? I asked, not really expecting her to say. She hesitated and then began to ramble. Three weeks, she said, exasperated. I've been coming here three freaking weeks trying to beat that stupid lich at that asinine game. And his AI is ridiculous. I mean, you know, I've never played Joust before this and now it's driving me out of my gourd. I swear that this close to finally beating his bum a few days ago and then she raked her fingers through her hair in frustration. Ugh, I can't sleep, I can't eat. My crates are going down the tubes because I've been ditching to practice Joust. 
I was just about to ask if she went to school here on Lotus, but then she continued to talk faster and faster as if the floodgates had opened in her brain. The words just poured out of her. She was barely pausing to breathe. And I came here tonight thinking this would be the night. I finally beat that bastard and get the copper key. But when I got here, I saw that somebody had already uncovered the entrance. So I realized that my worst fear had come true. Someone else had found the tomb. So I ran all the way down here, totally freaking out. I mean, I wasn't too worried because I didn't think anybody could possibly be accurate on their first try, but still. She paused to take a deep breath and stopped abruptly. Sorry, she said. I tend to ramble when I'm nervous or excited. And right now I'm sort of both because I've been trying to talk to somebody about this, and but obviously I couldn't tell a soul, right? You can't just mention in casual conversation that you... She cut herself off again. Man, I'm such a motor mouth, jabber jaw, liberated it. She mind zipping her lips and locking them and tossing away the imaginary key. Without thinking, I mind grabbing the key out of the air and unlocking her lips. And this made her laugh, an honest, genuine laugh that involved a fair amount of snorting, which made me laugh too. She was so charming. Her geeky demeanor and her hyperkinetic speech pattern reminded me of Jordan, my favorite character in Real Genius. I had never felt such an instant connection for another person in the real world or in the Oasis, not even with age. I felt lightheaded. When she finally got her laughter under control, she said, I really needed to set up a filter to edit out that laugh of mine. No, you shouldn't, I said. It's a pretty great laugh, actually. I was wincing every word coming out of my mouth. I have a dorky laugh, too. Great blade, I thought. Now you just called her laugh dorky, real smooth. But she just gave me a shy smile and mouth words, thank you. I felt a sudden urge to kiss her. Simulation or not, I didn't care. I was working up the courage to ask for her contact card when she stuck out her hand. I've got to introduce myself, she said. I'm Artemis. I know, I said, shaking her hand. I'm actually a huge fan of your blog. I've been a loyal reader for years. Seriously? Her avatar actually seemed to blush. I nodded. It's an honor to meet you. I'm Parzival. I realized that I was holding her hand and I made myself let go. Percival, eh? She tilted her head slightly. Named after the Knight of the Round Table who found the Grail, right? Very cool. I nodded, even more smitten. I almost always had to explain my name to people. And Artemis was the Greek goddess of the hunt, right? Normal spelling was already taken, so I had to use elite spelling with a number three in the place of an E. I know. You mentioned that once in your blog, two years ago. I almost cited the date of the actual blog entry before I realized I would make it sound like an even more cyber-stalking super creep. You said that you should run into noobs who pronounce it art three, miss. That's right, she said, grinning at me, and I did. She stretched out the racing gloved hand and offered me one of their contact cards. You could design your own card to look like just about anything. Artemis had coded hers to look like a vintage Kenner Star actions figure, Still in the blister pack. The figure was a crude plastic rendering of her avatar with the same face, hair, and outfit. Tiny versions of her guns and sword were included. Her contact info was printed on the card above the figure. Artemis, 52nd level warrior mage vehicle sold separately. On the back of the card were the links to her block, email, and phone line. Not only was this the first time a girl had given me her card, it was also by far the coolest contact card I've ever seen. This is by far the coolest contact card I had ever seen, I said. Thank you. I handed her one of my own cards, which I designed to look like an original Atari 2600 adventure cartridge with my contact info printed on the label. Cards of all, 10th level warrior. Use joystick controller. That's awesome, she said, looking at everyone. What a wicked design. Thanks, I said, blushing under my visor. I wanted to propose marriage. I added her card to my inventory and it appeared on my items list right below the copper key. Seeing the key listed there snapped me back to reality. What the heck was I doing? Standing here making small talk with this girl when the first gate was awaiting me? I checked the time. Less than five minutes until midnight. Listen, Artemis, it was truly awesome meeting you, but I gotta get going. The server's about to reset and I want to clear out of here before all those traps and undead respawn. Oh, okay. She actually sounded disappointed. I should probably prepare for my job spatch anyway. But here, let me hit you with a cure of serious wounds before you go. Before I could protest, she laid a hand on my avatar's chest and muttered a few arcane words. My hit point counter was already at maximum, so the spell had no effect. But Artemis didn't know that. She was still under the assumption that I had to fight the lich. <clears throat> there you go, she said, stepping back. Thanks, I said, but you shouldn't have. We're competitors, you know. I know, but we can still be friends, right? Hope so. Besides, the third gate is still a long way off. I mean, it took us five years for the two of us to get this far. And knowing Halliday's game design strategy, things are only going to get harder from here on out. 
She lowered her voice. Listen, are you sure you don't want to stick around? We, I bet we can both play at once. We can give each other jousting tips. I started to spot some flaws in the king's technique. I was starting to feel like a jerk for lying to her. It's really a kind offer, but I've got to go. I searched for a puzzle to see if that's school in the morning. She nodded, but her expression shifted back to one of suspicion, and then her eyes widened, although the idea had just occurred to her. Her pupils began to dart around and focus on the space in front of her, and I realized that she was looking something up in the browser. A few seconds later, her face con contorted in anger. You lying bastard! You dishonest sack of crap! She made her web browser window visible to me and spun it around. It displayed the scoreboard on Halliday's website. In all the excitement, I'd forgotten to check. I looked just as it had for the past five years with one change. My avatar's name now appeared at the very top of the list in first place with a score of 10,000 points with high. The other nine stops, slots still contain holidays and initials, JDH, followed by zeros. Holy crap, I muttered. And when Anorak handed me the copper key, I'd become the first gunter in history to score points in the contest. And I realized since the scoreboard was viewable to the entire world, my avatar had just become famous. I checked the newsfeed headlines just to be sure. Every single one of them contained my avatar's name. Stuff like Mysterious Avatar, Parzival makes history, and Parzival falling to the key. I stood in a daze, forcing myself to breathe. Then Artemis gave me a shove, which of course I didn't feel. She did knock my avatar backwards a few feet, though. Who beat him on your first try, she shouted. I nodded. He won the first game, but I won the last two. Just barely, though. Crap, she screamed, clenching her fist. How the heck did you beat him on your first try? I got the distinct impression she wanted to sock me in the face. Your luck, I said. I used to play jazz all the time against a friend of mine, so I already had a ton of preparation. I'm sure if you had as much practice, please, she grabbed, putting her hand, don't patronize me, okay? She let out this I can only describe as a howl of frustration. I don't believe this. Do you realize I've been trying to beat him for five weeks? But wait a minute. I thought you just said it was three weeks. Don't interrupt me. She gave me another shove. I've been practicing jazz nonstop for over a month now. I've been seeing flying ostriches in my sleep. That can't be pleasant. And you just walk in here and nail it on your first try? She, was, she started pounding her fist into the center of her forehead, and I realized that she was mad at herself, not me. Listen, it really was luck. I've had a knack for classic arcade games. It's my specialty. Uh, stop hitting yourself like Rain Man, okay? She stopped and stared at me. After a few seconds, she let out a long sigh. Why couldn't it be Centipede or Miss Pac-Man or Burger Time? Then I'd probably have it cleared on the first gate by now. Well, I don't know about that, I said. She glared at me a second and then gave me a devilish smile. She turned her face to exit and began to execute a series of elaborate gestures in her hand in front of her. Hey, hold on. What is that? What are you doing? But I already knew. She finished casting her spell. A giant wall appeared completely covering the chambers on the exit. Crap. She cast a barrier spell which trapped inside the room. Oh, come on. Why did you do that? You seem to be in an awful big hurry to get out of here. My guess is when Anorak gave you the key, gave you some sort of clue about the location of the first gate, right? And that's where you're headed right now, isn't it? Yeah, I said. I thought about denying it, but what's the point now? So unless you can nullify my spell, I'm I'm betting you can't, Mr. Tenth Level Warrior. That barrier spell will keep you until just about midnight when the server is reset. All those traps you just are on your way down reset, and will slow you down your exit considerably. Yes, it will. And when you're busy waking your way back up to the surface, I'll have another shot at defeating Akarak, and this time I'm going to destroy him, and then I'll be right behind you, mister. Fold in my arms. If the king had been beating your butt for the last five weeks, what makes you think you're finally going to win tonight? Uh, competition brings out the best of me, she replied. It always has, and now I've got some serious competition. I glanced over the magical barrier she'd created. She was over 50th level, so it would remain in existence for the spell's maximum duration, 15 minutes. All I could do was stand there and wait for it to dissipate. You're evil, you know that, I said. She grinned and her, shook her head. Chaotic neutral, sugar. I grinned back at her. I'm going to still beat you to the first gate, you know. Probably, but this is just the beginning. You'll still have to clear it. And there are still two more keys to find and two more gates to clear. Plenty of time to catch up with you. And that's leaving the dust ace. We'll see about that lady. She motioned to the window displaying the scoreboard. You're famous now. You realize what that means, don't you? I haven't had much time to think about it yet. Well, I have. I've been thinking about it for five years. Your avatar's name will be in the scoreboard, going to change everything. The public will be so obsessed with the contest again, just like it was in the first when it first began. Mina's already going berserk. By tomorrow, Parzival will be a household name. That made me a little queasy. You could become famous in real world too if you're 
reveal your true identity to the media. I'm not an idiot. Ugh. Because there are billions of dollars up for grabs and now everyone's going to assume, you know, how to get, know how and where to get the egg. And there are a lot of people who kill for that information. No, appreciate your concern, but I'll be fine. Uh, but I didn't feel fine because I hadn't really considered any of this. Maybe because I've never really believed I've actually been in this position. We stood there in silence watching the clock again. Hey, what would you do if you won? She suddenly asked. How would you spend all the money? I spent a lot of time thinking about that. I daydreamed about it all the time. H and I had made an absurd list of things we would go and buy if we had to win the prize. I don't know. The usual, I guess, move into a mansion, buy a bunch of cool stuff, not be poor. Wow, big dreamer. She said, and after you buy your mansion and all the cool stuff, what do we do with the 130 billion you'll have left over? Now, I don't even think I was some shallow idiot. I impulsively blurted out what I've always dreamed of doing if I won, something no one ever told before. I have a nuclear power interstellar space shuttle craft constructed in Earth's orbit, and I'd stock it with a lifetime supply of food and water and self sustaining biosphere on a computer, supercomputer loaded with every movie, bomb, book, song, video game, piece of artwork human civilization has ever created, along with a standalone copy of the Oasis. And then I invite a few of my closest friends to come aboard with me, a team of doctors and scientists, and we'd all get the heck out of Dodge, leave the solar system, and start looking for an extra solar with Earth like planet. I hadn't thought this plan all the way through yet. Of course, I still had a little idea as I was working out. She raised an eyebrow. It's pretty ambitious, but you do realize that nearly half the people on this planet are starving, right? I detected no malice in her voice. She sounded like she would genuinely believe I might not be aware of this fact. Yes, I know, I said defensively. The reason so many people are starving is because we wrecked the planet. Earth is dying, you know, it's time to leave. It's a pretty negative outlook, she said. If I win the dough, I'm going to make sure everyone on this planet has enough to eat. Once we tackle world hunger and we can figure out how to fix the environment and solve the energy crisis. I rolled my eyes, right. And after you pull off that miracle, you can genetically engineer a bunch of Smurfs and unicorns to frolic around this new perfect world you've created. Being serious, she said. You really think it's that simple? You can just write a check for $240 billion and fix all the world's problems? I don't know. Maybe not. But I'm going to give it a shot. If you win. Right. If I win. Just then, the Oasis server clock struck midnight. We both knew the second it would happen. Because the throne appeared atop the dais along with Akarath. He sat there motionless, looking just like he had when I entered the room. Artemis glanced at him and back at me, and she smiled and gave me a small wave. See you around, Percival. Guys, yeah, we'll fight. See you around. She began to walk towards the dais, and I called after her. Hey, Artemis. She turned back. For some reason, I felt compelled to help her, even though I knew I shouldn't. Try playing on the left side. Sorry, I won. I think it might be easier to beat if he's playing the stork. She stared at me for a second, possibly trying to gauge whether or not I was messing with her. And then she nodded and ascended the dais. Akarat came to life as soon as she set foot in the, for the first step. Greetings, Ark and Artemis. What is it that you seek? I couldn't hear her reply, but a few seconds later, the throne transformed into a joust game, just as it did earlier. Artemis said something to Lich, and the two of them switched sides so that she was on the left, and then they began to play. I watched them play for the distance until a few minutes later when her barrier spell dis dissipated. I cast one last glance up at Artemis and then threw open the door and ran out. Hmm. Should he have told Artemis? I don't know. I don't think I would have. 